this is the closing event of this academic year's Hot of the Press. And it's a really a pleasure and a honor to be able to discuss with Loïc Vacan about his last one, actually not his last book, one of his last books, namely Bourdieu in the City, Challenging Urban Theory, which has been published this year. And uh, Loïc is actually a very prolific writer. He wrote, I don't know how many books, but for sure four books this year or in the last 12 months, let's say. And um, from the expanded 20 years anniversary edition of the famous Body and Soul Notebooks of an Apprentice Boxer by Oxford University Press, when we have the invention of the underclass, a study in the politics of knowledge by Politicus, and then two French books uh, on Voyage au Pays de Boxeur, published by La Découverte, and uh, La Misère de l'Ethnographie de la Misère. We wanted, however, to focus on this Bourdieu book because we thought it would nicely complement also some other books in the series which were addressing some strong theoretical statements like uh, Jenny Robinson's uh, opening lecture and presentation. So uh, Loïc Vacan is a French-born sociologist and a social anthropologist and a professor of sociology at the University of California in Berkeley. And he doesn't need much of an introduction, actually. Uh, and I will not introduce him. You can read in his blog about his publication, about his theoretical framework, and he will also present it to you. I would like just to mention two things that he was a student and a very close collaborator to uh, Pierre Bourdieu in France, but also of William Julius Wilson in the US. And this combination, I think it's very interesting for us today because he combines two worlds in a very provocative and very challenging uh, urban theoretical framework, which we are very happy to, to hear today. Both had a, quite an important role in his intellectual history and trajectory, also on the themes he worked on and uh, urban inequalities, racism, the process of ghettoization and the penal state actually. And so really thanks a lot for being with us uh, today. Before giving you the, the floor for your presentation, I would like also very briefly to present the two discussants. Um, Bruno Cousin, who is at Sciences Po, he's also a sociologist with a strong comparative approach. Uh, he's affiliated, actually like also Loic, at the Center for European Studies at Sciences Po, and uh, also with the Cities Are Back in Town research group at the Urban School at Sciences Po, which is apparently having today a, a big event as far as I heard, because Enzo is there. And um, he holds the chair for on cities, housing, and real estate, conducting a lot of comparative work, working also on inequality, segregation, social capital, the practice and meaning making of the wealthy people, which is an interesting contrast uh, to poverty and social exclusion, but which is actually very strongly connected to, to the topic. And on this book, on this issue, he published uh, together with Serge Pogam, Camilla Giorgetti, and Jules Nadeau, uh, Circular Riche Pense de Pauvre for, uh, for Soy. The second uh, discussant uh, is Christoph Reinbeck, uh, who is a Viennese urban sociologist and a professor of sociology at the department uh, here with me, actually, is a good colleague at the University of Vienna. And he's also uh, French, very strongly connected to Paris. He's an associated fellow at the Centre de la Recherche sur l'habitat de Senares in Paris. So we have a quite French biased panel today, but given the topic, I think that's totally legit. Um, Christophe has a lot of research interest and addresses also uh, inequalities, migration, urban studies in a broader sense, political sociology, memory studies, uh, and things like that. When I moved to Vienna, he became my, my reference point for his vast and critical knowledge about the city and that he actually very generously shared with me and I'm very thankful for, for that. So I stop here. Uh, I give the floor to Loic and thank all of you for being with us today. And uh, the format will be half an hour, 45 minutes max presentation. And then the discussant, then a first round of quick answers, and then the floor will be open for a discussion with everybody online. Okay, Loic, please, the floor is yours. 
Thanks a lot. Uh, thank, thanks. I want to thank uh, Yuri for this kind introduction and for this invitation that gives me a chance to uh, to discuss with colleagues uh, in Europe and I imagine some of them around the world uh, the main ideas of the book uh, of Bourdieu in the City Challenging Urban Theory. Um, I must say this is the first time I speak about the book, so it's the official it's the official world launch of the book, and I've prepared remarks. So first, I, I also want and I want to thank the discussants for taking the time to read the book closely. I presume, and That's for uh, sharing sharing with us their yeah. their, their reactions. Um, I, I apologize in advance if I'm not very fluid and very clear. It's because I'm immersed in presenting quite another book, um, The Misère de l'Ethnographie de la Misère, the, Miser the Poverty of the Ethnography of Poverty, which is a book of uh, ethnographic epistemology, theory, and advocacy. And I'm in the midst of presenting this book, you know, and so it's, it's kind of a, this morning I had to get up early and try to reread some of my, some of Porto in the city to make sure that I remember the argument. So let me let me uh, let me proceed with my remarks, which I've entitled Porto in the city: Think uh, tools for rethinking the urban. And if I want, if I had to summarize the book in two sentences, I would say it's what does Bourdieu tell us about the city on the one side, and what does the city tell us about Bourdieu? on the other side? What can we learn from their two-sided encounter? Um, so it's a, and, and I hope there's a, there's a triple payoff um, to, uh, first of all, the book proposes a new reading of Bourdieu, highlighting four transversal principles that underlie his work and try to move people away from the classical, you know, the, the usual triad, habitus, capital, field, and people kind of feel like if I have a handle of these three concepts, I can I can do something. And and I I I pro provide a very different reading of Bourdieu, articulated by what I call the Bachelard, the Weber, the Durkheim, and the Cassirer moments. Um, and I dig up from the work what I call the trialectic between. So the, the dynamic relationships between symbolic space, the categories with which we cut up the world and organize it, uh, so mental, mental constructs, symbolic space, social space, which is the space of the distribution of forms of capital, economic, social, cultural, symbolic, that, that determines the set of positions that agents, you know, Occupy and in particular agents as they are categorized through symbolic structure. And the third, the third space is physical space. So the the you know the, the geographic expanse that we occupy, but also space as it becomes transformed, you know, either space as humanized nature in rural areas and the built environment in the cities. So when I propose that we can reread Bourdieu as providing a topological sociology anchored by this trialectic between symbolic, social, and physical space. Let me close the door to my apartment so that my neighbors are spared this uh, presentation. Um, so that's one. Um, and then, uh, and then I'm going to argue that Bourdieu, we can draw on this reading of Bourdieu, the four principles and the three spaces to either get rid of urban sociology, that is dissolve urban sociology into a broader topological social science that looks at the articulation of these three spaces, no matter where they show up. So it could be in the city, it could be in a, a suburb, it can be in a semi-urban environment, it can be in a rural environment, and, and therefore, in a sense, the specificity of the city disappears. Or, on the contrary, we can use Bourdieu to ground urban theory by developing a distinctive concept of the urban 
and I'll, I'll, I'll briefly, you know, characterize it as the urban is the space of accumulation, differentiation, and contestation of forms of capital. It is where, you know, uh, economic capital, social cap capital, cultural capital, symbolic capital, but also the varied subspecies of capital, you know, religious capital, legal capital, juridical capital, political capital. The, the city is the space where these capitals accumulate, differentiate from one another. And once they differentiate, they raise the issue of the relative hierarchy of capital, because once you have different holders of different forms of capital, they each want to impose their, their own species of capital as the dominant form. And so you have an ongoing struggle and contestation of capital. And here, what I think I introduced, that's a novel idea, if I introduced one, is the idea that in the urban milieu where capital accumulates, the first form of contestation of capital is not by those who don't have capital, workers, the you know, subaltern categories. Rather, the first form of contestation of capital is by people who possess other forms of capital. So it's the contestation of capital by capital. So that's, that's the, first, the first leg of the characterization of the urban according to Bourdieu. But the urban is also according to Bourdieu or you know, using Bourdieu, um, the place where habitus becomes uh, internally incoherent or internally fragmented or stra stratified in ways that create tensions between the different dispositions. And also the place where habitus has a great probability of encounter encountering a social world with which it is not fully in agreement. So I summarize this, that for Bourdieu, the urban is the place of accumulation, contestation of capital, and the space of the, of the meeting of uh, habituses that are, you know, uh, um, incoherent and incongruent. And I will argue that, in a sense, urbanizing Bourdieu, late, in my conclusion will be that urbanizing Bourdieu strengthens his account of the genesis of fields and therefore the different forms of capital, but it unsettles his theory of habitus. You know, in a sense, the theory of habitus where habitus is internally coherent and externally congruent, where there is a minimal, where there is a strong agreement be between the agent and the world, this works well in a sense in the village society, which is not highly differentiated and in which agents you know, don't participate in worlds that are you know, differentiated and separate from one another. But once you move to the city, this hypothesis of the internal congruence, internal coherence and external congruence of habitus is very problematic. Okay, so that's, that's you know, and in a sense, you know, there's always been a tension in urban studies between the studies of the city, the city as a specific milieu with distinctive properties, you know, of course, the Chicago school being the founder of this tradition and the sociologists in the city. Sociologists who study, you know, I don't know, commodification or gender relations or, you know, or class struggle and so on, and who do, who do so inside the city because the city is a propitious site to study this phenomenon. So this tension between the sociology of the city and the sociology uh, in the city, I think Bourdieu gives us uh, uh, the tools to resolve this tension and to do both at the same time you know, to do both the sociology of the city as distinctive milieu, accretions of capital, formations of habitus, or the sociology in the city, the articulation of the three spaces, symbolic, social, and physical, as it takes place in the city. So that's, that's essentially, um, essentially the, the core of my argument. So now I want to kind of walk you through the main, uh, structure and the main thesis of the book. Um, and there's three, three long chapters that each uh, provide one. Uh, it's like walking three steps to go to upstairs to the, to, the, to the new room upstairs of a reconfigured urban, urban sociology. First, it's what I call Bourdieu in the urban crucible. And Bourdieu in the urban crucible is an effort to, to um, dig out the kind of the hidden urban sociology in Bourdieu, that is 
Bourdieu's approach to, in particular, not the urban, but urbanization as a process. And so in that chapter, I lay out the, you know, the conceptual perimeters and the frames of the book. And I want to establish that Bourdieu is indeed pertinent for students of the city. And so I revisit his youthful work on power space and the diffusion of urban forms, both in colonial Algeria. So it is, this is his youthful work in colonial Algeria and in provincial Béarn, the, you know, the regional, the, the small rural uh, mountainous region where Bourdieu was born and raised uh, in southwest of France and where he studied his own village society in the early 1960s as an exercise in reflectivity. Um, so in both sites, colonial Algeria and provincial Béarn, the urbanization appears as the key vector of, of social transformation. And the city or the town or the camp in the case of colonial Algeria are the sites that, anchors, that anchor the forces that are dissolving the fabric of the, of the peasant society. Uh, dissolving the fabric of the French countryside and overturning uh, French colonialism in North Africa. And, and, and so let me just briefly spotlight Bourdieu's dissection of the resettlement camp where millions of Algerian peasants were corralled and regrouped by the French military in an effort to undermine support for the uh, nationalist uh, uh, rebels, or as they were called by the French state. Um, so these millions of Algerians were regrouped in these camps that were organized as if they were small French towns with kind of geometric organization with a church at the, at, at the center and so on and so forth. And Bourdieu studied these resettlement camps uh, and he showed in them a dra dramatic disarticulation of symbolic, social, and physical space that was caused by the forced mass relocation um, and so, briefly put, the Algerian peasants come into the camp with symbolic structures, for instance, the opposition between the public and the private, the male and the masculine and the feminine, the inside and the outside, the high and the low, and so on. These are the symbolic structures that they bring with them from the village society, through which they perceive everyday life in the camp. But of course, these, these, these mental schemata are you know are completely out of out of kilter completely incongruent with the physical layout of the camp and with the social relations as they are regrouped as they um, are developed in the camp for instance to give you a concrete example in the village society of course um, kinship relation is the anchor uh, of the village society in the camp Kinship relations and clan relationship between clans are, you know, are distended, are disrupted, are cut off, and people begin to have to develop relationships with people who are their neighbors. So suddenly, neighboring relationships, you know, become important in structuring social space, and so it means that again, social space, like physical space, is discordant with the mental structures that the Algerian peasants bring into the, into the camp. So we see this dramatic disarticulation of symbolic, social, and physical space caused by forced mass relocation. Instead of being aligned, cognitive categories, position in stratification and location in the layout of the camp are scrambled. And this yields a, a paradoxical pattern of anti-urban urbanism. So what do these early, and I'll, you know, I'll skip over, I'll let you read in the book, the discussion of the, of the, uh, the work in, uh, in, um, in Béarn and the opening of the village society to the outside, in particular under the press of the market, under the press of the, new, the news media, the mass media, and under the press of the school, three institutions that are anchored by the town or the city, and, the, and, and that creates this, this you know, this intrusion into the, into the kinship-based um, peasant society of the village uh, and, is, and, and is really the force transforming it. Um, so what do these early studies uh, establish? They establish that all social and mental structures have spatial correlates 
and spatial conditions of possibility that social distance and power relations are both expressed in and reinforced by the manipulation of physical distance. For instance, one of the uh, priorities of the French colonial power, you know, was to, was to master, to control, to reshape physical space, to control at every moment what particular social category is allowed to traverse or to stay in what particular physical expanse of the territory of Algeria. And when Bourdieu was doing his study, he was very keenly aware of that because he was studying, he carried out his studies of the, of the camp um, um, in areas that were strictly interdicted by the French military. He had to have special permission. Um, so, so next, I discuss the four principles that underlie Bourdieu's investigation. And I, you know, I mentioned them already. I'll just, I'll just briefly stay, state what they are and I'll skip and we can go back there in the discussion if needed. But there's the Bachelard moment of epistemological rupture, the Weberian moment of historicizing, historicizing the agent, that's the purpose of habitus, and historicizing the social world, that's the purpose of social space or fields. And of course, historicizing the categories of the analyst, then there is the Durkheimian imperative to deploy the topological or structural mode of reasoning. And then last, last but not least, it's, it's an author that most readers of Bourdieu completely miss out the key influence of Ernst Cassirer, the, the German philosopher, um, author of a multi-volume book on the philosophy of symbolic form. And Cassirer had a great influence on Bourdieu um, in articulating the idea that human beings relate to the, to the physical world, not directly as matter pressed against matter, but rather through categories of perception, categories symbolic form. Um, so then, you know, then I go into a discussion of how to use Bourdieu, and I'll, I'll, I'll just keep that, uh, other than to say that you have to have, a, you have to develop a very flexible, irreverent relationship to Bourdieu's work to make it work. Bourdieu was, you know, was a, a very, he was an organized uh, uh, eclectic. He drew from the, the gamut of intellectual and theoretical traditions without being wedded to one of them. And I think when you, you should relate to Bourdieu as Bourdieu related to the, you know, to the thinkers of the classical, to the classical tradition. He has a paper, for instance, called, uh, with Weber against Weber, you know, and in a sense to, to fully develop a sociology in the mold of Bourdieu, you have to, you know, you have to be with Bourdieu against Bourdieu. You know, for instance, in my book, uh, The Poverty of the Ethnography of Poverty, you know, I break with his Bourdieu was very uh, skeptical, in fact, very negative about the possibility of deep immersion ethnography. Uh, he thought it was an illusion, that it was an obstacle, and I, you know, I beg to differ and I disagree and I elaborate the notion of inactive ethnography as a way of you know, uh, showing the virtues of doing ethnography where the, where, the, where the analyst, where the sociologist performs the phenomenon and situates herself at the point of production of practice. So, um, so eschew, the, eschew the, fetish, the fetishization of Bourdieu's concepts Beware of the rhetorical temptation to just speak Bourdieu's when the concepts really do not do any work. And do not hesitate to poach Bourdieu's toolbox, toolbox for one or another notion, another notion. There's no need to, you know, you, if you borrow just one concept, they just say habitus or symbolic power, and you don't take the other concepts that go with it, but you get a lot of mileage out of it, more power to you. Um, so second, so this is, this is for the first, the first chapter of the book. In the second chapter, the second chapter is entitled the, better the Bitter Taste of Territorial Taint. And it is essentially taking seriously Bourdieu's. So if, there, are seven, there are seven major concepts in Bourdieu. Let's see if I, if I can remember them all. I, you know, and and don't, don't chastise me if I don't. But um, habitus, capital, field, social space, Symbolic power, um, reflexivity, and doxa. Okay, so these are the seven concepts. 
But there is one, you know, if, if I had to choose one and say, this is really most distinctive, the most powerful concept that he has developed. So Bourdieu himself would say field, you know, in his recently published book, Microcosm, that bring together uh, his various studies of fields, you know, shows that he, you know, he's got an argument. But to me, his most central concept is the notion of symbolic power. Symbolic power is the capacity to transform, to shape the world, to transform or to conserve the world by transforming or preserving representations of the world. It is the capacity to diffuse, inculcate categories of perception of the world so that if you wanna, if you wanna dominate an agent, the best thing is to instill in that agent the categories of perception, the skills and the desires that you want that agent to have so that they will spontaneously want and do the things that as the dominant you want them to do. You know, and the paradigm of that being, of course, a masculine domination under the rule of patriarchy. Um, so symbolic capital, symbolic power is really Bourdieu's most um, is signal concept. And chapter two is essentially saying, what can we do with symbolic capital when we study the urban? And I, and I return to a, to a theme that I've developed earlier in my work, which is the question of territorial stigmatization. So in that chapter, I both uh, return to, I formalize and I further develop the notion of territorial stigmatization by combining Bourdieu's uh, symbolic power with uh, Irving Goffman's uh, analysis of stigma and the management of spoiled identity. Um, and um, what I do, you know, that is that I was, for me, that was a kind of a ha ha moment. And I thought, oh, I've really found something new. Is as I, there's a diagram in which I articulate Bourdieu's notion of social space. You know, most people will be familiar with this, you know, um, two dimensional diagram with volume of capital in the Y axis and composition of capital in the X axis. And you can distribute social agents, you know, in, in this map of social space. I use this map of social space and then I distribute the fields of cultural production, journalism, politics, science, for instance, in which the representations of the, the negative, nefarious, sulfurous representations of neighborhoods of the urban periphery or you know, neighborhoods of relegation, where are these negative representations created? So I argue they are created there in these fields of cultural production. And so I situate the fields of cultural production in social space. I locate these fields of cultural production in what Bourdieu calls the field of power. And I track down the production, the diffusion, and the consumption of territorial stigma throughout social space. Um, and so I sketch a topological model of the production, circulation, consumption of spatial taints that can guide further comparative research on the mapping of symbolic space on physical space via, via social space. So combining, you know, uh, combining the three fields, you know, symbolic, social, and physical space. Let me see. Oh, that's not, I'm, I'm doing pretty well. Uh, so in, in that chapter, I argue that, of course, there's always been stigmatized neighborhood, actually starting in the mid 19th century in the European cities. There was a topography of disrepute, you know, in the in the Paris of 1848, the, the Paris, you know, studied by Louis Chevalier in uh, 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 laboring classes, dangerous classes, uh, there was this notion that certain neighborhoods were the neighborhoods of a counter society, particularly of a criminal society. And there was the same representations uh, de developed in, in England, you know, in Germany, in Latin America later. There's a beautiful book by Khalifa, K-A-L, you know, L-I-F-A, which is available in English, which studies, you know, the, the creation of the underbelly of the city and its representation uh, across the centuries. Um, and um, so I argue that spatial taint or territorial stigma or, um, in, the, in the late 20th century, early 21st century is very distinctive. It has a number of distinctive property that separated 
from territorial stigma during roughly the era of industrialism. Um, and, you know, and um, I argue some of these differences are that territorial stigma has become autonomized from the stigma of poverty and ethnicity. It has become nationalized and democratized, meaning uh, the, the bad neighborhoods, everybody know, everybody in the national society know what the bad neighborhoods or the bad towns are. These are, you know, and everybody, not only the, you know, in a sense, the intellectual elites, but even ordinary people know, you know, know what the bad cité in France are. You know, they know when that, when they hear, you know, Aubervilliers, when they hear La Courneuve, they, you know, they are filled with dread and they are filled with anxiety. And they, this name evokes, you know, uh, evoke uh, uh, fearful, uh, fearsome images. Um, and in particular, the reaction of the state to the development of these deprecated districts of relegation uh, has been distinctively punitive. Punitive, um, and indeed those districts have served as the testing ground for policies of penalization of poverty fostered by neoliberal state restructuring. Um, so what I do, in addition to providing this topological model of the production consumption of territorial stigma, I also um, expand on my analysis of the strategies that uh, people deploy. So the strategies that the state, that ordinary citizens or that residents of, of stigmatized neighborhoods develop. Um, and I propose that these, um, these strategies Range, you know, so in my early work, I, I portrayed, I had, I provided a one sided portrait uh, in which residents of stigmatized neighborhoods essentially accepted the stigma and managed the stigma. And here in my new analysis, I expand this analysis and I show there's a broad panoply of strategies that range for, from submission to the stigma to indifference to the stigma to defiance of the stigma, and that the adoption of those strategies depend on the social position and the trajectory of the residents. Um, and in, for instance, let me give you a contrast. Obviously, you know, young female, you know, residents from families from post-colonial migrants, you know, living in the 4,000 housing projects in La Courneuve are not going to manage the stigma in the same manner as let's say um, a sixty-year a sixty-year-old um, French, you know, white uh, homeowner of of a small, you know, single home housing that is across the street from the large concentration of public housing, they will, you know, they will manage the stigma very differently due to their different uh, position in social. And, physic and physical and symbolic space. Um, so, and then, and then I point out that because I argue that territorial stigma has become a fixture of urbanism in all advanced societies. Um, and this is pointed out by the fact that research on territorial stigma has mushroomed across four, con four continents now. And they point to the need, so, what shall we, in terms of public, in terms of urban policy, it points to the need to not, not simply ameliorate neighborhoods of relegation on the material front, but also engage in policies of destigmatization of these neighborhoods. Because the, you know, the, the burden, the symbolic burden imposed on the residents is heavy. Uh, and this is due to the extraordinary stickiness of stigma as negative symbolic capital once stigma has seeped into the mind of a broad public, it's hard to uh, take it out. It's hard to wash it. Um, it's a fundamental asymmetry of stigmatization. It's easy to, to tarnish and it's difficult to cleanse. Uh, and one government that has discovered that recently is the Danish government, which in, in the early 90s created an official ghetto list. And, and in a sense that became widely used not only in the media, but in everyday life. And everybody knew 
what what neighborhood was on the ghetto list and then they realized that the government realized that by putting out this 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 list it it kind of singled out you know these neighborhoods and bad neighborhoods it created for instance strategies of avoidance on the part of firms who don't want to go into a neighborhood that has been listed as a you know as an official ghetto and so the, the irony is that the, the designation as a ghetto created you know self self-fulfilling prophecy that reinforces the stigma and the marginality of these neighborhoods then they officially withdrew the list and say no no there are no ghettos anymore there is no list well but you can you know the the horse is already out of the barn. You know, you can't, you can't bring the stigma back. So then, third chapter or third part of the book, um, it's a revisit of the triad of marginality, ethnicity, and penality in the neoliberal uh, metropolis. Um, I, I go back to the, to the, triangular nexus of think of class in my in my right hand race in my left hand and at the top where my fingers meet the state so think of this triangle of class ethnicity or class race and state and inside of the triangle you have the city uh, and inside the city at the bottom you have the neighborhoods of relegation and and so i try to uh, to to analyze uh, the relationships between each side of this triangle um, and to give instruments to understand how this triangular relationship shapes neighborhoods of relegation, in particular, three neighborhoods that I call the ghetto, the hyper ghetto, and the anti ghetto. Um, um, and so, what I show is that. Uh, you know, I, I'll go quickly through that. The, I, you know, I, I use this triangle to clarify categories that are, you know, kind of left undefined or or badly defined, such as the category of the ghetto. I, I try to fashion new concepts, of obviously territorial stigmatization that I just talked about, but also advanced marginality, punitive containment, liberal paternalism, hyper incarceration. And negative sociology um, tools for the comparative sociology of the genesis uh, of the post-industrial precariat in the neoliberal uh, metropolis precariat meaning the precarious fractions of the proletariat um, and i stress the need in this analysis to hold together the material and the symbolic moment uh, of social action um, so one, one central argument or one argument that um, kind of arose to me and I realized that I had made the same mistake as the mistake that I'm going to point out in others, you know, so in a sense, it's uh, a self-critique as much as a critique of, of, of other students of the city is that urban sociology has completely missed the penal state, has completely, you know, um, treated you know as a marginal object the police the courts the jail and the prison and there's a long section in that chapter on the jail as a core urban institution in which i show that if you want to understand the social and the moral order of the city you have to bring the jail you know so the jail quickly you know put the jail is this institution where the police brings people who have been arrested and are awaiting judicial disposition of their case or you know, or people who have been sentenced to short time of you know of, of of confinement, typically under one year, and then and then and then once people are sentenced, or if they are sentenced to multiple years of reclusion, then they are shipped out to prisons, and prisons are far away from cities. They are typically located so jails are located typically near the city center. Why? Because they have to be close to the courthouse so that people can be brought in and out of the courthouse for adjudication of their case. So there's a very good reason for the jail. Jails are urban animal in a very, very real sense. They are, you know, they are a core institution, just like the criminal court, I would argue, is a core urban institution that urban sociologists have left, have, have left legal scholars and scholars, you know, 
um, have, le have left legal scholars to study the courts when I would argue you know, that it's, it's a it's pivotal institution of management um, and, and marking and branding of, uh, of marginal populations, that is populations sit situated at the bottom of the hierarchy of class, ethnicity, and neighborhood. So jails are inside the city, but once people are sentenced, they're, they're sent, sentenced to prison. Prison are far away because urban residents don't want the stain and the danger represented by convicts, but also because you know, land is very cheap um, and security is easier to guarantee in a rural environment than it is in an urban environment. But prisons are urban institutions. They are satellites of the city. They contain an ur the, your quintessential urban population with urban norms, urban social forms, urban family forms, urban, urban you know, institutions, urban symbolism. They're all, you find them all in the prison. So the prison is really a satellite of the city and, and urban students of the city are, you know, are guilty of, you know, of, stud of not studying and not realizing the central place that both the jail and the prison play in the instruments of management of urban marginality. And so now I will, I have five more minutes. So, so that's, that's my pitch. Um, and in the, in, the, in the past few years, I conducted a field, a field study and ethnography of, of the criminal county court um, in, a, in a county of Northern California called, that I call by its you know, fake name, uh, the county of uh, El Pedrito. Um, and I studied the everyday life um, in the courthouse, the triangular interaction between prosecutors, public defenders, uh, and judges. Um, and it's my contribution to uh, uh, urban sociology to bring the criminal courts um, into uh, the fold of, 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 urban, of urban study. So now, You know, and, and, and when you read the chapter, you will see how, you know, how Bourdieu's tools, and particularly the notion of symbolic power, how, how Bourdieu's con con construct of the state as the bureaucratic field and also the central bank of symbolic capital helps me thematize the question of punishment and helps me realize that punishment plays a major role in particular in justifying and legitimating extreme urban inequality at the bottom. Just like uh, elite institutions and higher education provides a justification and legitimation of those situated at the upper reaches of the social and urban structure, you know, this is what we could call a positive sociodicy using, you know, uh, and, and, and at the bottom, the, the agency that provides a justification for the dereliction and the danger and the mistreatment of those situated at the bottom of the class, ethnic, and spatial order is the criminal justice system and particularly uh, the courthouse. So now let me close with what I just mentioned earlier you know, in my presentation, the, 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 the two ways in which um, Bourdieu uh, proposes, you know, gives us tool to reconceptualize the urban as the domain of accumulation, differentiation, contestation of manifold forms of capital, um, including crucially the contestation of capital by capital rather than simply by those who don't have capital and the city as a meeting ground for the variegated habituses, which effectively makes the city a central ground and a central prize of historical struggles. Then I conclude, you know, with, with this paradox, absent presence uh, of the city in Bourdieu's oeuvre. In a sense, urbanization was a driving force um, in the emergence of the state. It was a driving force in the emergence of fields of cultural production like the literary field. The literary field cannot but exist in a city. So Bourdieu wouldn't be studying, you know, the field of, you know, the literary field, you know, in, in the time of Flaubert, if he wasn't studying an, an urban environment. And there are distinctive features of the urban environment 
that make possible the salon in which the literature, the arts, the art world uh, developed. And I found I find a beautiful sentence in his in his um, in one of his studies where he sh where he actually accidentally notes, you know, that that the that the museum, you know, it required a city for a museum to develop. So the world of art, the the microcosm, the artistic field would not have developed, but in an urban environment. But Bourdieu is mum on the specificities of the city as a social milieu. Um, and when he addresses urbanization as a process, it turns out to be pivotal to his argument, but it is inexplicably left in the background. Um, and then I, you know, and then I discuss some of the reasons why I think Bourdieu didn't become an urban sociologist. Uh, because also in the mid in the mid sixties, he wrote a review of an important book by by a sociologist by the name of Cuin, who who wrote a study of housing of low income housing in France. And Bourdieu wrote a review of the book in Le Monde. So obviously, you know, and, and you know, and, and, he, and he had in his study of, um, of work and workers in Algeria, there's an extensive discussion of housing as a pivotal uh, ground on which classes, the working class forms or doesn't form. And where, you know, access to regular housing and in particular you know in the case of algeria modern european style housing was you know in the rationalization of household strategies in the projection into a long-term future and into uh, the process of class formation so bordeaux was keenly interested in the housing in the late night in the in the late 80s he did his famous study of the housing field which becomes the social structures of the economy in 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 2000 and of course, there's there's his study of of the French urban periphery in in uh, in the the weight of the world. So Bourdieu had these various moments, and also I can mention that around 1994, 93, 94, um, a wealthy patron of the Collège de France wanted to give a, a small castle. He had a castle outside of Paris, and he was going to gift the castle. Uh, to the Collège de France and Bourdieu had as a plan to create an institute for the study of the city that would be based in that small castle and of whom I would have become the executive director. So you see there was, you know, there was pretty much, there's these moments where Bourdieu kind of, you know, comes close to becoming a, an urban sociologist but doesn't become an urban sociologist. I won't tell you why, you'll have to read the book to find out why. And so let me, uh, let me close. Let me close this presentation by um, yeah, by inviting you to read the book and to uh, to go and pillage pillage Bourdieu's work. You know, uh, ransack it, loot it. Uh, you know, go in there. You will find. You know, you have this this profusion of concepts, this profusion of analysis. Bourdieu has written in just about any topic except the city, per se. But he has written about many aspects of city life. So go in there, read what you find, you know, um, grab a concept, run like a thief, uh, and use it to produce your own objects. The, the best way to be truthful to the spirit of Bourdieu is to use and misuse his concepts to produce new objects. That's really where the that's really where the you know where the payoff is, is not you know, not genuflect. In front, and I hope that when people read the book, the book comes out as an anti genuflection book and a pro production book. You know, take take the concepts, and then if it allows you to to draw out descriptions, to produce interpretations, to hammer out explanations of phenomena that you couldn't have produced without those concepts, then really you've made them work, and you've 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 uh, You've joined in the, you know, in the collective enterprise of advancing urban studies with whatever instruments are fruitful. Thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, Loic, for your, well, you, you made a connection between your work and, and Bourdieu's work and probably also helping reading Bourdieu with new eyes. And this is already a step in the direction of using it and being a thief of his concepts and adopting and producing new work uh, by that. 
I would immediately leave the floor for the discussions so that we can have the, dis the general discussion afterwards. I don't know if uh, Christoph or Bruno would like to go first. Maybe Bruno eventually. Okay. okay. Are you guys hearing me? Perfectly. Yes. Thank you. Okay. So thank you very much, uh, Yuri, for uh, this invitation. Thank you to Loic also for giving me the opportunity to discuss uh, his work. It's really a great pleasure and, in fact, an honor to do it. Uh, so some of you might know it. Like so the work of Loic has been very important since I'm well, I was a student in influencing mine, and it actually still is. And uh, uh, we'll see why. And of course, uh, this book is uh, clearly an important book. Uh, I'm experimenting it actually myself, both in making the effort I've read it. I'm now sort of like working on it, sort of like to review it. And I'm also actually taking it, uh, uh, taking it suggests, and I'm actually trying to operationalize it in some of my own research. And I, it's something that really I invite all of you uh, to do. Uh, so it's a it's an important book for many reasons that Loic, Loic has already uh, presented, uh, in part, of course, because he, he actually regroup and compile and reorganize all the contribution to, of Bourdieu to what we can call urban sociology and more generally urban studies in a sort of like methodical way, which is something that like Bourdieu himself never sort of like did. That basically, to be honest, Loic has also been doing through his own work uh, along the years, but here is made in a very pedagogical way, which is basically very useful. It is also, in fact, uh, implicitly a story of sociological talk that actually, I think that we can also, we could have even, and, and the book actually does it, but maybe you could have maybe have said it even more explicitly now, because the fact is that, of course, until the beginning of the 80s, there was the fact that urban sociology was largely uh, almost a reserve field of post marxian sociologists in France. And there was this sort of like division of uh, different school of talks that were sort of like oversighing several uh, different parts of like the study of society. And that might have a relation for which uh, uh, might be part of the reason for which why Bourdieu didn't frontally tackle and try to invest the, um, the fit of urban sociology, even if he actually asked some of his collaborators to do it. I mean, like the work of like Le Maire and, uh, 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 and Chamboredon about like, uh, you know, the, the life in social housing complex is probably, is probably that. And then of course, there is the fact that the book also, uh, through the work of Loïc and through the way in which Loïc show us how we can sort of like uh, work in the footstep of this or the urban sociologists and actually try to go even further. Uh, it it shows us how we can sort of like apply this sort of like this paradigm and these uh, sets of uh, approaches to study uh, our own case studies and uh, how to theorize from them. And it shows us how he, he does it himself. So that being said, of course, it means that I could sort of like go into sort of like into detail and try to uh, you know, like, and, and I'm sure there's going to be also some form because of the, of the third part, I mean, of the last part of what I just said, there's going to be people that are sort of like going to challenge your orthodoxy or such and such interpretation. And that is going to be sort of like probably a very interesting uh, discussion, but not the direction in which I would like to use my time uh, to go now. What I would like to do is uh, like uh, to go a bit beyond the detail and to try to uh, address actually the main uh, theoretical and central thesis of the book, which is basically the use of the trialectic and be a bit provocative and sort of like try to sort of like challenge it uh, from uh, other positions and other such contemporary sociological approach. And I'm, I would like to do that by basically asking three questions. So uh, as you might, as you probably know, uh, uh, Loic, uh, so actually this, uh, uh, you're sort of like uh, uh, the fact of keeping together and trying to articulate uh, uh, the analysis of uh, uh, physical space, social space and symbolic space. Uh, it's also something that actually uh, cultural sociologists as they call themselves have been uh, trying to do uh, for a while in the United States. There is basically like an article of nine years ago by Lamont, Belgeau, and Matthew Clear called What is Missing? Cultural Processes and Causal Pathway to Inequality that actually take almost uh, identically these like three uh, orders of organization and hierarchization and sort of like uh, um, 
try to show how you can articulate them and try to show why actually cultural sociologies through the analysis of meaning making processes uh, is uh, uh, one of the right way to do it. The, one of the big difference with the way in which you do it uh, and Bourdieu did it uh, and you do it in uh, the footstep of Bourdieu is that they actually affirm that you do not need to do it in a structuralist way. Uh, in other words, they do it in a non-topological way by basically saying that you should focus on process, that we should focus on process, that we should focus on the way in which a mechanism of differentiation and hierarchization and legitimization of these differences operate. And that to do that, there is actually no need of a basically, you know, of a structural or spatial representation of the symbolic space, of the social space, and uh, of uh, like basically, and of course for the physical space is a bit different because it, it's the physical space. So one of the uh, one of the questions that I will ask you to uh, answer is like, uh, so do you? I mean, how can we basically? Why do? Why does the trialectic? Um, I mean, is it possible to sort of like defend the idea that the trialectic could be non-topological? Uh, because it, it's actually what they're doing and can you maybe explain why you think um, as a, um, i'm sure you do that it actually needs to be topological and that actually we do need to keep being structuralist in fact so that's the first point the second point is uh, the fact that uh, um as bourdieu you of course focus on the fact uh, i mean you do believe of course in so that social change can happen and that uh, you sort of like uh, explain it and illustrate it uh, uh, speaking about the dynamic interplay, of course, between these uh, sort of like three uh, uh, orders of analysis. And in fact, uh, the, the dynamic interplay between symbolic, social, and physical space is probably one of the, I mean, it is not probably, it is one of the explanation of basically social dynamic, of, of like of social change. Uh, however, of course, when once you say that, which of course is something that can be empirically observed, you sort of like will basically stumble on in the possibility of accusation of causal circularity and you will of course end up being confronted with like a neo-marxian critique which would be you know like which will tell you okay but is there isn't there a sort of like order of analysis that is uh, uh, the most causal the one that is the real cause of the other ones uh, with people telling you at the end it might be actually what happened in the social space in the distribution of capitals rather than you know a causality that you know originate in the symbolic order uh, and uh, uh, and of course as you point yourself especially among geographers uh, you know this neo-marxian approach is still very lively today less among sociologists but you know in, in an interdisciplinary perspective we sort of like need uh, probably to address that so what would you uh, answer about this possible accusation of circular causality and uh, to maybe the neo marxian stance that what really matters is actually uh, the order of social space. And then uh, my third observation is about, uh, I mean, of course, the very, interest point, the very interesting point that you make of the fact that uh, uh, of sort of like requalifying in a Bourdieuian way what basically the city is as basically the this idea of you know uh, the city as a play of confrontation and struggle between habituses which of course it's it's a way to say in a more precise and conceptualized way something that has been saying said in whatever the ancient testament you know that basically like city brings diversity together and is you know a place of confrontation dissolution of uh, of parochial identity uh, potential anomie etc cetera, etc cetera. so in other way here is the but he, here the idea of course is that you could uh, and but it's also a way of course of qualifying of describing the city as the potential place of social change because here of course you have basically these habituses these different habituses that are confronted which basically it's another way to say that they are sort of like disadjusted to the routine of the daily life and that basically this disadjustment cause something comes so cause some ripple into the way in which they confront reality that make them that you know that bring up reflexivity create situation in which people need to sort of like need to readjust which at this point of course uh, brings a third 
potential critique, which would be the one that interactionist or so-called pragmatic sociologists would sort of like at that point probably formulate, which is, or maybe even people like Eli Anderson, you know, that sort of like in an interactionist way speak about like a, a black and white space and analyze this moment in which people might feel estranged, disadjusted, and, uh, and, and confronted to different kind of more or less cosmopolitan norms. And so sort of like at that point, you might have people that could tell you, okay, so in fact, if that's true, does that mean that in fact, at the end, the only way to really explain social change, which is in a way I'm connecting uh, question three to question two, is in fact this order of the interaction and which will be in fact a way to say that habitus might matter, but actually, what really matters is the confrontation, the struggle between habitus, therefore the interaction, uh, which is if you want a way to sort of like, well, bring back the idea that the, the order of the interaction is, might be the one that matters the most, and maybe it might have to serve a more prominent you know, place in your, uh, in your analysis. So of course, I'm being, I, I sort of like have like an idea that I know you, do, you will have answer to these questions, and some actually some of the answer to this question are implicit and in some cases even partially explicit in your book, uh, but uh, I, I would like to hear them maybe in a more uh, clear way. Uh, and yeah, and I made the choice of asking the question like that in such a provocative way. Thanks a lot, Bruno. Um, you noted all questions, Loic. Uh, yep. Yeah. Do we go with Christoph Weinbrecht, uh, and then you answer both of them, or you prefer to have? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I'll answer both of them. Okay, perfect. Thanks a lot. So, Christoph, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Yuri. Thank you, Loic and Bruno. And I'm sorry if there's is some noise, because I'm on the playground with my on the football playground with my son. So. Uh, <laughs> I'm uh, watching his training, so to say, and it's a kind of surveillance. <laughs> um, no, but um, that maybe there are some disturbing noises in the background. So I'm, thank you very much, Loic. Um, uh, it was really um, a great pleasure to read this book, especially because um, I was absolutely happy um, that uh, what you what you said also in your presentation that. Um, that you try to develop a flexible approach or a flexible, flex, flexible way to appropriate a Bourdieu's work for your own work and for us readers. So to say, it is not a dogmatic um, sociology you, uh, you propose here in the sense of uh, a Bourdieuian urban sociology is more how we could read uh, Bourdieu and how could Bourdieu's work, which is, as you said, a kind of organized eclectic work is a very nice um, um, notion, uh, may help us to understand what's going on in our cities today, especially under the neoliberal conditions. Um, what I would like to, to stress is only um, two points. One is that um, I'm, as I read the book, I'm, I, I, will, I became sort of, sort of say, um, mentally empowered, <laughs> so to say, <laughs> Yeah, because I remembered, uh, because I, I remembered uh, in three fields of research I did recently uh, that uh, I learned so much from Bourdieu, but especially also from your work, uh, Loic. Uh, one is um, uh, we did a lot of st studies on social housing in Vienna, and you know, social housing in Vienna is such such an emblematic field of you you cannot bring it into critics because uh, social housing is uh, something like very nearly a holy sphere, so to say. But of course, uh, if we read uh, Bourdieu, and unfortunately, um, very, very, very few colleagues uh, here in Austrian and German speaking countries are um, knowing Bourdieu's um, analysis of housing uh, system. If you read uh, Bourdieu, uh, the social housing itself is a part of um, uh, the production of housing market and the actors involved in it. And this is so important to know because the function, as we identified it also here in Vienna, the function of social housing is also to sustain, to, to sort of say, a certain way of unequal distribution of wealth. The second, um, the second, even if there are some emancipatory potentialists of course, we can discuss later. The second point, the second field of research I 
I'm, uh, I refer to Budget, but also to your work is, um, is research we did on, on <laughs> we started with, with research on segregation. And this is a typical sociological approach to urban studies. But of course, what we finally did is to identify wealth and the strategies of wealthy people and wealthy inhabitants to develop boundaries and to distinguish from, from other parts of society. So what was Pensons, and you refer a lot to Pensons and also Bourdieu, they, they, they are referring to Bourdieu. What, 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 what is so important here is that and what you, and as I understood correctly in, in a more recent work, uh, the misery of the ethnography of urban ethnography, this is the misery of always looking on so that it does the city uh, as a source of social problems. But of course, the city is, as you said, and uh, is a, a field of accumulation, of contestation, of differentiation. And if we approach that way, we, we would focus also much more, and we should focus much more on the wealthy people and the ways how accumulation of capital is, um, is so to say, applied. Um, the third, and maybe the most important, and you, you, you spoke a, a lot about in your presentation now, at the, at the end about the chains, uh, the third field of research uh, we did more recently is on camps and encampment of refugees. And this is something where I would say this, your uh, concept of territorial uh, stigmatization of advanced marginality, a, a very, very helpful. And of course, uh, the dialectic of, uh, so to say, approach of Boudieu is very helpful to understand how, um, how, how camps are, as you said, urban institutions. What is so important here is if we apply Bourdieu and the way how you propose to read Bourdieu, we, read, we would not um, do the same um, error as many did, for example, to identify the camp as uh, the nomos of the political system today. Because if we do so, we have, we cannot speak about differences and we would neutralize dif the difference between, for example, uh, to totalitarian uh, regime uh, camps and, uh, and the camps of, uh, of enforced, uh, of, of, uh, of refugees uh, in worldwide distributed today. So these are three fields of research. I personally uh, refer to uh, Boudieu and I was very happy to read in your, uh, in your book, that I will, it was it was right decision to do so. Let me, uh, but let me say at the end that um, finally, especially in the in the in, in in our research on camps, there was one point. I think it is maybe important to go one step further. If you speak about, if you use, for example, a concept like advanced marginality or territorial stigmatization, we we could say that the field, a, ter a territory is not only a relational, something relational, it is also something processual. That means there is a process of territorialization and the process, and in the process of territorialization, one aspect is a key one, this is the visibilization. So to make visible or invisible um, uh, and to make, uh, to make people, Cap capable to see or to be seen. And this is so important because finally, uh, it is not about, I think, uh, in, for example, in the, in the context of camp construction, not only, uh, it is not so much about, or it's not only about management of territoriality or of marginality, it is about management of visibility. And um, I would be interested, there's a, there's a very interesting work of Andrea Brigenti, for example, and I would be very much interested if you know this work and how you would think it could be integrated in what would you develop and what you applied in your own research. Uh, yeah, that's what I would, this was, is my short contribution, my short uh, reflection on your work. Uh, I think Bourdieu for us as social scientists 
is always important because uh, what you call the Bashla approach. So it, it, in, it forces us to, to a critical reflexivity in our research to, to understand that finally what we are doing is always, always embedded in power relations. Uh, but reflexivity is not only a demand or a requirement we should answer, respond to. It is also something we, we, we meet in the field if we are doing research. And uh, maybe this is also something we should develop further. And I, as I understood correctly in your last sentences, this is what you're doing uh, in your recent work. Thank you very much, Loic, for your wonderful book. So thanks a lot, uh, Christoph. Loic, the floor is yours for reactions okay. and answers. First, let me thank my critics for their generosity uh in their precision in their comments and questions and then uh, uh let me respond uh briefly that way we can open the discussion to uh the people from around the world or from around many countries who are following this debate um first the earlier um discussion by cultural sociologists of something like a trialectic um, I think you answered your own question, which is that the part that they didn't have, which is absolutely pivotal, is the topological dimension, the idea that there's a correspondence between the relations that we ob observe in symbolic space, you know, high, low, left, right, and so on and so forth, and the relationships that we observe in social space and the relationship that we observe in physical space. And that these three, and that these three, so there's a structuralist moment that the cultural sociologists miss entirely. And I think that's the, that's the valorization that Bourdieu brings. But then there's a second step, which is that this, this structuralist moment itself is grounded in history, which is the structures are not universal atemporal structures. For instance, let's take the symbolic structures and let's use as an example, you know, uh, eth ethnic categorization, you know, which is practiced in many states. You know, like the ethnic categorization system as recorded by, let's say, a census form, you know, is a good example of a materialized uh, symbolic structure. Well, it's easy to show that this, you know, the category is used, the principle of categorization. These are, er these are historical given that are the result of struggles. Some categories battled to be named, other categories battled to be merged and to, to disappear. There's a battle in France to have ethnic statistics. You know, some people want them, other people don't want them. So there's a battle around classification that results in the existing dominant you know, or doxic form of thinking, which is our symbolic structure. So symbolic structure is a result of struggle. It's not universal. It's not, this is the big difference between Bourdieu and Kantians. For the Kantians, you know, these categories are universal. They are a priori, they, you know, they are eternal. Uh, for Bourdieu, everything is historical. Everything is you know, reducible to historical struggles. And so this is true of symbolic stru structures. Similarly, social space, as we know it at a given moment in history, is the result of the battle over, you know, for the appropriation of different forms of capital, for the recognition of different forms of capital, for the conversion rates of one form of capital into another. This is the result of struggle. And similarly, the physical space as we know it, you know, like the built environment, the fact that, you know, that the sixth district is not, you know, um, is not configured the same way as the 20th district of Paris. All of these are the, the, the materialized product of past struggles. So there is in Bourdieu both, uh, you know, or in the reading that I propose, both a, structuralist moment that is very strong, but this structuralist moment is itself linked to a historicist uh, ontology, to a historicist conception of, of social entities. And if I had to, if I had to um, characterize in this, in this respect what Bourdieu does, he, he provides a historicist ontology that becomes the basis for an agonistic sociology. You know, an agonistic sociology from agon, you know, the conflict, the competition, you know, is this idea that, you know, whatever realm of life you enter, 
you will see that there is a competition, there is a struggle, there is a struggle to appropriate you know, the goods that are valuable in that universe. There's a struggle to change the boundaries of that universe. There's a struggle to admit or to exclude agents from that particular social game. And so this idea of both structure and struggle, I think are distinctive in the approach that, uh, that Bourdieu gives us. Second question, the question of the, uh, the question of the acquisition of causal circularity. I would argue that I, I plead guilty I plead guilty 100%. Uh, the social world is full of causal circularity. And, and it is not the task of sociologists to, um, to resolve on paper questions that are not resolved in reality. That is to say, for instance, let's take again the example of classification. You can classify by class or you can classify by ethnicity. You can construct the world socially by class or you can construct it by race. So, and, and, and so, you know, the critique would be, you know, either there's a, you know, it's, it's not for the sociologist to affirm some kind of uh, eternal priority of one category over the other. Um, all that the sociologist can do is to study the struggles that lead to one category being predominant in one period, in one history, in one country. And then the other category, you know, class, you know, being predominant in, you know, in Europe in the 19 in the interwar period and then race becoming predominant in the in the in the US south you know after the after abolition there was a big battle after abolition you know um, with the populist wanting to promote class as a basis of of categorization as a symbolic system to organize social space and to shape physical space and that battle was enjoined and that battle was lost by the promoters of class and was won by the promoters of race. You know, and I, I, I tell that, I have, I have a brief discussion of that in my book on racial domination. Uh, but so the, the, the circularity is in the social world. Um, I think, you know, I won't say Bourdieu, make, Bourdieu does this or that, but I'll say, um, Taking my inspiration from Bourdieu, I argue that well, I, I think Bourdieu, that, you know, there are no strong ontological claims about, for instance, what form of capital are dominant. If you study Kabil society, symbolic capital is dominant. Economic capital has not been autonomized. If you study the contemporary United States, well, certainly economic capital and then one variant of economic capital, which is technological capital, have become, you know, in a sense, autonomized to an extraordinary degree, and they become the dominant form of capital. But, you know, but remember that a capital is always, you know, always exists in relationship to a particular game or to a particular milieu. And so nothing is capital in itself and nothing is as primacy, you know, eternal primacy over, you know, over other forms of capital. I always give as an example, the Soviet revolution, you know, you had a society, you had an estate society organized around, you know, around distinctions of nobility. And so economic capital and symbolic capital were the dominant factors organizing Russian societies in 1917. And then overnight, political capital took over and de-autonomized economic capital. So, so no, no ontological claims about the prime priority or primacy of this of, or that form of capital and likewise, no claim about the primacy of the symbolic space over physical space. You know, in a sense, we can we can be agnostic as to which you know, you know, is there you know a space that dominates the other. You know, and when I when I drew the diagram, the book has many diagrams that I could have used for a PowerPoint, but I'm I'm tired of making PowerPoint presentations. So you know, uh, so I didn't want to use PowerPoint. But there are many di diagrams in the in the book. And there's one that 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 uh, uh, represents the structural uh, relationship, the homologies between symbolic, social, and physical space. And you know, and I and I try different variants of that of that diagram, and and I realize that every variant that I could use always kind of evokes a social unconscious about which one is primary which one, you know, we all have in our head, 
the base superstructure model. You know, we all have that in our head. We, if we represent the three spaces, you know, spontaneously we'll put physical capital at the bottom, a physical space at the bottom, social space in the middle, and symbolic space at the top. Why? Because, you know, we see, you know, the material and the symbolic, the material is down on the ground, the symbolic is high in the sky of ideas. You know, we all have, all have the base superstructure model. You know, and, and I tried, I figured, you know, you know, I, I thought, I don't remember if I discussed it in the book, but I thought, I try to have them, you know, uh, vertically represented, you know, uh, so that I would avoid the top to bottom uh, and then it didn't work either because it 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 activated another social unconscious. Um, the city as a place of social change. Yeah, of course, this is not a new uh, uh, remark, but I think that the conceiving the city as the place of accumulation, differentiation, and contestation of capital gives us a handle on trying to understand and to link the different kinds of social changes that we observe. For instance, there are social changes that come from the mere fact of capital differentiating itself, and let's say juridical capital and political capital. And you know, lawyers and politicians, you know, are going to, you know, there's there's not only each field has its own momentum for change, but the relationship between the fields also are um, are a, a source of change. So the introduction of the idea of microcosms of you know different 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 spheres in which the different forms of capital become differentiation, differentiated and accumulated adds to the source of change that are endogenous to those fields, the source of change that come from the different relationships and the frictions and the competition and the struggles and the conflicts between the different fields. Uh, you know, and then I had in my note, um, you know, struggle is the engine, you know, um, the engine of change is, you know, struggle, whether it's struggle within particular microcosms or struggles between the microcosm. Then the question of, of Christian, I, I think I, I can answer also briefly. Um, looking at the city as a site of social problem. I think this is, you know, this is where there's a good uh, critique by Tom Slater, um, you know, um, in his recent book that I should say, his recent book that I fabricated, I told him, Tom, you have all these different articles. You should bring them together, articulate them, you know, provide and re rewrite as needed, you know, but, but and, and then you should call it shaking up the city. And so there he goes, you know, he does exactly <laughs> what, I, what I suggested. This is, this is why I, I was joking with him that I should get the royalties for this book. But, you know, but the rupture, with the common sense vision of the city as, you know, is very important. And this is where social urban sociologists or social students of the city should always make sure that they break with the managerialist vision of the city where what we study are what poses a problem to the managers of the city. And which creates a skewed, you know, urban sociology that is completely you know, uh, distorted towards the interest of state managers and where in particular, for instance, the city of the wealthy and the city of the privilege, you know, doesn't quite disappear. There's still, you know, there are people, you know, uh, you know there's a few, but when, but I, when I found, but there's very, very few monographs of the city of the wealthy. I list them all. I have a, I have a section in the book where I, where I discuss the disappearance of the city of the wealthy and the privilege, the powerful and the privileged. I point out, for instance, that in the tradition of urban ethnography, which I know well, you know, born in the US and developed mostly there, you know, there's a complete bias, not only to the poor, you know, to problem categories, to the deviant, to the dangerous, to the defamed, but there's also, you know, a, a bias towards, you know, me black men, you know, uh, I, I use as an indicator of that, the fact that the, the, the handbook of urban ethnography edited by Murphy, Dunayer, and Kazidits, out of, I think, 60 something, 50 something chapters, 24 chapters are about black men in the inner city. You know? and, and, and so when people hear city, they hear the poor, they hear the immigrants, they hear the camps, they hear the public housing projects, 
you know, they look, they don't hear the prosecutors, the professors, the politician, the, you know, and, and in a sense, we have ceded that part of urban studies too much to, in particular, for instance, political science. We have ceded, you know, uh, too much of the study of the, of the, you know, there are studies of the courts and studies of the, by criminologists and legal scholars, but they, but they lose entirely the urban dimension. Um, then, so, yeah, so we need to spotlight the invisibility of the city of the wealthy and the privileged. Um, in, on, on camps, in my book that I just finished on racial domination, I, I developed the category of social seclusion, spatial, social, spatial seclusion, which is also in an article by that title, Designing Urban Social, Social Spatial Seclusion, in which I try to provide a framework where we are going to link those spaces that are at the top and those spaces that are at the bottom, those spaces in which people are trapped by constraint and those spaces in which people self-seclude, self-confine themselves out of privilege. And, and, and in the, the, the discussion of racialization and seclusion, I discuss three, ur three urban forms that have, that have served this purpose. And they are the ghetto, the camp, and, and then in the rural areas, the reservation. Um, and I try to show the parallels, but, and the differences between them. But again, you know, we have to, I, for instance, when people study segregation, they study the segregation at the bottom, the segregation of the poor and the segregation of the ethnically marked. They forget what is the primary form of segregation in advanced societies is the self-segregation of the rich and powerful. You know, um, the, the, so, uh, and then last question, I, I would, the, you say territorial stigmatization is a process of visibilization or hyper-visibilization. But at the same time, every process of hypervisibilization is also a process of invisibilization. And in particular, what we don't see in these neighborhoods of relegation, what disappears from the picture is people who live normal, banal, common lives, you know, who are, in a sense, untouched by the brouhaha uh, around those neighborhoods, who are untouched by, you know, by the street economy and the drug economy, who are untouched by... So there's a lot of normality, there's a lot of commonality, uh, and there's a lot of banality, uh, even in the neighborhoods that are represented as urban hell holes. And I think it behooves urban students of the city to recover this banality, this normality, and these commonalities. And I'll stop there. Okay, thanks a lot. Um... We have now uh, more or less half an hour time for open up the discussion. Uh, so you can ask the questions in the chat box uh, or you can raise your hand and pose the question orally, as I mentioned. We have one question already in the, in the chat box. Uh, if nobody raises his or her hand, I will read it out. Uh, so you mentioned the Bourdieusian trialectic of symbolic space, social space, and physical space. So where is, so where is the virtual space like Facebook? Does it matter to the city? Question mark. Mm -hmm. So does cyberspace yes. matter to the that city? Would be... Well, I look at, you know, digital technologies and platforms as a way to mediate interaction, you know, and in a sense to negate the limitations of physical space, but they belong thoroughly to the symbolic space. They, you know, in a sense, they're a, com a combination. They eliminate the, the boundaries of physical space, and, but, they, but they re-articulate the boundaries of social and symbolic space. You know, people, people communicate with people whom they see as part of my box, part of my mental category. They, you know, or, or they draw boundaries, you know, us and them, you know, either by communicating violently or by segregation of audiences. You know, I, my chat, you know, my chat group, my, my, my Facebook group, you know, I have only people who are in the same, you know, in the same classification box as me. I only have people who, think who have a view of the world that is similar to me. 
Um, so I, you know, I think that the that integrating cyberspace is the neg again the negation of physical space and the the recreation of techn technology mediated interaction between social space and symbolic space. Thank you. I, I see that there there are several. I'm very bad at you know. I see that there were seven messages in chat and now there are zero. I must have done something wrong. No, they have been visualized. So when, when they visualize, uh, they oh, disappear. they disappear. Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, Monica uh, Defense has a question. Please go ahead. You have to unmute yourself first. Otherwise, we cannot hear you. Oh, yes. Hello. Oh. Hello. Hello. Uh, thank you very much for this very, very interesting question and book because I think it's very important to focus on the state uh, and, uh, and, and thinking about change, uh, social change, urban the relation, city and state. Um, I was really um, amazed by reading, I have only read the introduction of your book so far, so I'm, I would be interested in more con conception if you can explain, but I was really amazed by reading the, uh, the tragic dynamic of uh, um, social, physical and uh, symbolic. symbolic space, because that is actually what I'm working on since many years. And I'm happy to recognize this. And uh, I may, uh, unfortunately, I didn't see my reference in your book because uh, actually in 2008, I wrote an article on in European Journal of Social Theories uh -huh. on contemporary political theories of the European city questioning institutions, which was, um, which I also posted here in the chat where in my conclusion I conceptualized this tragic dynamic of um, uh, how do I say int I, introducing an intersubjective understanding of urban culture as a tragic dynamic between academic knowledge socio-political institutions and built cityscapes might allow to define political agency as endogenous to the urban context so uh, you're not working on agency, but more on structures. Um, my work then, uh, the work uh, was referred to Patrick Legale's book and the wider debate on European cities at the time, uh, where uh, there was the debate about urban collective action uh, uh, as uh, cities, as European cities, as collective actors. And I criticized this debate about European cities as uh, by uh, men um, showing that uh, by referring to diversity uh, and that uh, basically uh, and that it basically agency is only possible if we uh, well if we think of diversity and not only about structural coherence. And uh, so uh, I did not follow up much on this tragic dynamic later because actually this concept stems from my thesis on cultural and urban regeneration, where I work on, for example, my book on capital city cultures is about symbolic politics of in capital cities, where I showed that states and symbolic culture of states um, uh, basically, um, is redefined within the global context of uh, urban competition and where that diversity plays a role. Uh, because, and I didn't refer more to it because um, in my thesis, I also referred to somebody who was, I think, Lee at that time, who uh, wrote a book on Bourdieu and the city. And then actually Patrick Legales was on my thesis jury in, at EUI Florence. And he said, no, you cannot uh, talk about Bourdieu with refer reference to the city because Bourdieu only, only wrote about national uh, culture and national habitus. And it's nonsense to write about Bourdieu and the city. And so I just uh, basically thought, uh, continue to think about this uh, tragic dynamic without mentioning Bourdieu in order not yeah. to, uh, to provoke any French sociologists. Yeah. <laughs> 
And so I'm pretty happy. Uh, the thing is, uh, I think uh, I'm not under, I'm not fully clear, as I'm also not generally clear about Gutierrez's work with regard to structures and reflexive practice. How does if habitus is is kind of the question about coherence of internal and external um, representations of the city. Uh, so um, how do we think about, how can we think about change uh, you're, if we only work on structures and don't think about agency? Where does change come from? Or is this all an evolutionary process uh, that is uh, um, driven by modernization? Uh, and, uh, so yeah, otherwise I'd be happy to continue the debate on uh, on on these things in on the urban okay. politics. So so I think you know for Bourdieu practice emerges out of the confluence of habitus and social world. And they are so it means that they are sources of change that come from the habitus. When habitus lack coherence, they will you know um tend to generate strategies that are irregular or that are not reproducive of the social world. Also, habitus is, so there's sources that come from habitus, sources that come from the social world, and sources of change that comes from the relationship between habitus and social world. So the Bourdieu has no trouble. So a common mistake is to read Bourdieu as saying, habitus is always coherent and produces predictable strategies. Well, you know, his own habitus was not fully coherent. He, he calls it a cleft habitus because he, he was kind of a mishmash between uh, Southwestern peasant values and Parisian intellectual values. And this creates kind of a cleft habitus that produces practices that are not reproductive of the social order. The, but so that's from within. But there's also the relationship between habitus and world. It spans the whole spectrum between pure agreement, where the agent is in agreement with the world and does what the world expects and knows how to read the world. And, and that's going to lead to reproduction, to smooth reproduction. But it also goes all the way out to the other end to complete disarticulation, complete disagreement, where the, you know, and then and then all the range in between. And you know, a, 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 a simple example is you know somebody who migrates um, across national boundaries or across social space. Who, somebody who you know who is born in a working class family and and enters the academy or enters the upper class or marries into the bourgeoisie. Well, obviously you know they are they are you know they are not in in agreement. They are not in a in a full agreement in spontaneous doxic agreement with the social world in which they now live. And so this creates perplexity. This creates you know, um, uh, resistance. This creates innovation. Uh, this creates new lines of action that are not, that will not perpetuate that world. Oh, and a good example is Bourdieu, you know, you know, who migrates across geographic space, migrates. So Bourdieu is a good illustration of the theory as I read it. Bourdieu changes symbolic category he leaves a stigmatized category of Bayarnate peasant and becomes a high-flying, highly prestigious, erratic professor at the Collège de France. He migrates in physical space from you know, the mountainous regions of Bayarn to the geographic center of, of Paris. And then he migrates across social space from you know, as the son of a, of a peasant become post, postman uh, to you know, be, becoming you know, at the highest, the apex of of uh, the academic world and he becomes an innovator is a good example he produced change in so in sociology because he should have been eliminated he shouldn't have come in into the sociological world he came into the sociological world with with a cleft habitus that was both intellectual and anti-intellectual and he came with the training as a philosopher and so he entered into the sociological sector of the academic field and he produces a revolution which is a good example of how intellectual change is produced by, you know, by an agent who should have been eliminated before and who enters into a social world 
with the dispositions that should not be allowed into that world because he's going to, you know, create a ruckus. And he did create a ruckus and change sociology to a large degree. So I think, you know, the 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 sources of the sources of change are, you know, are are manifold. And in fact, you know, uh, yeah, and the sources of change are manifold. Let's let's get to the next question because I was a little bit too long. No problem. So there is actually no question so far, but maybe someone would like to raise his or her hand now and intervene directly. Um, or I resolved all possible, all imaginable questions all doubts. <laughs> have been answered. Actually, I would like to ask a very short question on the curiosity. You said you mentioned the importance of jail, of the judicial system, mm -hmm. of the penal state, the, the whole system of law and defense and judges, etc. And uh, so this is very Durkheimian, actually. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering, uh, you mentioned also the, the recent study you did for ethnography in El Pedrito. <laughs> did you something similar also in Europe? And what would be your expectation to find in Europe in contrast to, to the no, US so, system? Excellent question. So first response, uh, no, I haven't done. It's enough work to do it in one country. Yes. You know, and the, the field material is so deep and so broad and so thick that it's going to take me the rest of my life yeah. to work my way through the, through the material that that I produced during my three years of field work. I, I can tell you that, you know, I will write on no other empirical topic for the, for the remainder decades that I'm, you know, that I'm productive. Um, I will not, so just the sheer volume of work would make it impossible, but I'm actually reading right now a book on the production of criminal judgment in France. Okay. Also another obstacle. So I may, you know, I may change my mind and I may develop a European counterpoint uh, to that. But also the, the legal specificities and the legal peculiarities are so intricate and are so distinct in the two countries that it's hard to explain. For instance, you have to explain the whole criminal procedure to a European or to an Austrian or to, you know, when you cross national borders, because each country has its own, you know, and, and, the, and the, you know, and the U.S. is a country of common law. You know, Europe is countries of Roman law. And so there's all these, you know, the... The judicial system, the criminal system in the in the, in the, in in the United States is a is a is one where you know. So so there's all these peculiarities, but but the other response to your question is, I would expect the jail, and the courthouse to be similarly central to the management of marginality, um, in France, in Germany, in Russia, in you know. In, in Italy, um, um, I would make the same hypothesis that um, an institution central to the management, both the symbolic management, the marking of population, the stigmatizing of population, the reproduction of the stigma attached to populations that circulate you know, in and out of the criminal justice system, um, the marking of space, uh, as you know, there's there's good research even on France. So in the U.S., there's excellent research showing how people who's who the that the criminal justice system is essentially centered on the neighborhoods of relegation. And there's a there's a it's the, the last chapter of my book on racial domination is on that is the circulation of the you know the population that comes out of prison comes out and goes into overwhelmingly into the poor, stigmatized, segregated neighborhoods of the city where they are over-policed and where there's every chance that they will be caught again and sent again for a longer time you know, to jail or to prison. And so there's a circulation of that. There's a circulation of bodies. There's a circulation of kinds of social relationships. For instance, diffidence, distrust of people, is a value that circulates that is prevalent in poor neighborhood and and that is prevalent in the prison that is where the carceral and the urban mimic one another so there's a circulation of bodies a circulation of social relations and a circulation of values you know masculine prowess and and the ability to meet out to meet violence with violence and so on are are you know 
values that are you know at the core of street culture in you know in the French urban periphery no less than in the American hyper ghetto and they are also you know prevalent in in the jails and, and prisons where you have to kind of enter into the social relations of the jail in order to get protection from you have to align you know with groups based on ethnicity and then you have to seek protection against violence so this the circulation of people, of social relations, of values between neighborhoods of relegation and the jail slash prison system is something that we observe everywhere. We observe it in, you know, we don't have good data, uh, you know, we don't in particular quantitative data, but there's good field studies on France showing, you know, that people coming from those sensitive urban zones, the Zeus, the, you know, neighborhoods that are targeted for special action by the French um, by the French urban policy are neighborhoods in which to go to jail is very banal, it's very usual. You know, people, in a sense, when they get to jail, they say, you know, who, who's in there from my neighborhood? <laughs> well, that's the first thing they want to find out. You know, who are my homies, you know, from my neighborhood? Um, and, and the stigma, you know, the stigma of going, so there's both, it's, it's you know, in in the in the American hyper ghetto, the stigma of going to jail or prison has washed out. So many people, you know, you are talking about neighborhoods in which seven out of eight, seven out of every ten young males, you know, has a criminal background, has recently gone to jail or prison, or has a prison a criminal justice file, you know, behind them. You are you are talking about neighborhoods in which more than half of the may of the of the men ages 18 to 35 are not in the neighborhood because they are in, the, in detention facilities. So there's a complete symbiosis between, you know, neighborhoods of extreme marginality and, and the criminal justice apparatus. And we see that as a, at, at a lesser level, you know, um, in France, we see it in, in Spain with the, in particular with the Roma. We see it with the Roma in Germany. We have good studies showing that there's an over over -rep, massive over representation of, of people of Roma descent, you know, in the in the German um, uh, uh, prison system, we know, you know, similarly, you know, that we have over representation of the of the Moroccans or the Surinamese in the Dutch, you know, uh, jail and prison system, and we know that the primary areas from which these inmates come are those neighborhoods where Roma or Surinamese are overrepresented. So this relationship of symbiosis between, you know, um, and then and then one additional point that I would make is that, I, you know, and, I, and I made in my presentation is significant distinction between the jail and the prison. I think it's very important uh, because a lot of people don't go to prison, but they spend a night, two nights, they are arrested, taken, you know. In France, they, they, they stay in the police locker. You know, they can do three days in, you know, in, in, in they are arrested by the police, they are taken in, they are, they are questioned, and then they are released with no charges. You know? uh, that's also an element of the penal state that, in, that, in, that intrudes upon the everyday life of young men from the urban periphery. You know, their, their, their sense of self, their, their image in the neighborhood, their social relations, their relations, their family relations, um, sometimes their relations to their jobs, they can lose their jobs. They, they say, you know, they, you know, if, if they are just, or, you know, um, so the, the clutches of the penal state, the, or the tentacles of the penal state are many and they are far reaching and they reach primarily inside of neighborhoods that are at the bottom of the hierarchy of class, ethnicity, and space. And it is high time that urban sociologists bring, you know, not just the state, but the penal state into their models. Yes, absolutely. I was wondering if it was a difference of magnitude or of, because the functions are clear uh, and probably are the same everywhere. But it, is it just an issue of magnitude that makes a difference between Europe and the US? Or is it also like the welfare state, which has quite a difference uh, inherently, ontologically, uh, which tries to promote or to, like activation policies can be promotion of the person 
or be punitive, like in the yeah, US well, they, yeah, market. Yeah. yeah, I think, I, you know, obviously I would expect that the configuration of the states, the history, the formation, the structure, and the policies of the states mm -hmm. are different on the two sides of the Atlantic. So mm -hmm. there are two differences. One is of intensity, of scale. You know, incarceration is, you know, through the roof in the United States. You know, it's, it's what, uh, nine, nine times or 10 times what it is in Aust Austria, you know, and, and obviously it's also, and the, the depth of the racial division between blacks and whites is such that the, the penalization of Af lower class African-Americans is, you know, on a scale, you know, unknown there. They are the most penalized or the most incarcerated group in human history, you know, yeah. not even the Kulaks under, yeah. you know, Stalinist uh, purge were, you know, were incarcerated at the same level. Um, so that's one difference. And this difference is of course related to the different structure and function of the state and the different relationship of the state to social space and the different way in which the bureaucratic field impacts uh, the shape of physical and social space. So we are back to, you know, we are back to the triad. You know, the state is, you know, is the agency that, that also controls, you know, symbolic divisions and activates symbolic divisions. So when you have a racial state like the United States, that constantly activates racial images and racial divisions, then obviously the state will project and will impact and will 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 draw boundaries and 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 and, and strata inside of social space based on these racial categories and will will help shape you know physical space according to these racial categories. You know, there's a long history of that. You know, to, today the you know the 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 racial segregation that can be observed in the United States in cities is the historical product. It's the sediment of the struggles going on in social space, but also of the policies of the of the American state, for instance, that refused that refused to uh, guarantee loans for purchasing homes in neighborhoods if the person applying for the loan was not of the ethnicity of the neighborhood. So you know, so the state racialized physical space. You know. Yeah. Uh, but again, we, you know, we can, I think we can analyze that, a, di a different articulation of symbolic space through the state of social space and of physical space as the materialization of social and symbolic relations. So we... but, you know, but, I, but I, hope, I hope that I've convinced at least one person in the <laughs> remaining 21 people that are, that are in the discussion that I've convinced at least one person to start a monograph uh, you know, there's there's beautiful work done by Manuela Cunha in in um, in Portugal, um, um, showing in a sense, you know, you're inside the neighborhood or inside the jail. It's the same thing. The the you know, there it's a porous membrane, and you know, the people cross the the, the boundary, uh, you know, and 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 they expect to see people from the neighborhood in the jail. They expect to see people from the jail in the neighborhood, and they you know, and they. And they, they organize their illegal economic activities across that porous boundary. And, you know, and so the two interpenetrate one another. And, and I, when I read her work, I see it as a contribution to urban sociology. And this is also because of the- for wealthy sorry? Neighborhood. If you end up in jail from a wealthy neighborhood, you often end up, at least in France, in some specific section actually of the prison or the jail with other yeah, people- Yeah, you're protected. You will be protected. You will be you know, considered you know, a personality if you, if you were, if you're especially, you know, so so the the so we should we should tear down the 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 disciplinary boundaries that make you know something is urban if it deals with poverty, social problems, segregation, immigration, and so and then and then and then people who study the penal state who are completely ignorant of the literature on urban marginality, you know, um, and and and. And you know, and then my 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 contention is that you can't understand urban marginality without understanding the penal state. And conversely, as a student of the law and a student of criminology, you know, you can't understand the functioning of the penal state to if you don't realize that it's there to manage urban marginality. And so, there are, when when mar urban marginality changes, you will see corresponding changes in penal policy and practices at ground level. And conversely, when penal policy changes. You will see changes in the population, you know, surveilled and captured and and regulated and branded, and so the two are in a dynamic relationship that 
calls for a collaboration between urban studies and criminology, but it's just not there. You know, I found only when I was trying to find, I found only one article in mm -hmm. a in a in a in a in a handbook of criminology that looked at urban civility. You know, and urban civility as a problem for at the at the crossroads of of urban studies and and criminology. You know, mm -hmm. but you know, but not not you know, and and. And I'm the first one to regret it. You know, I wish when I set out to to revise and expand my idea of the triangle, I thought, oh, now that I have time to look, you know, I'm going to do a systematic, you know, reference search for people who have studied, you know, the, you know, in inside of this triangle. And you know, and I always found people who who used either class and race, or race and state, or class and state, but class, race, and state. I didn't find, you know, and, 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 you know, and, and similarly, so when I wrote the section called the jail as core urban institution, similarly, you know, I, it, 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 in a sense, it's, it's a, it's an, it's an, the review of the literature is a negative review showing that there's nothing, you know, there's, there's virtually nothing. People have, you know, urban students of the city have, have yet to discover. So I point out there's one monograph. That is a beautiful monograph. I teach it in my urban sociology class. Okay. It's monographed by, by John Irwin, and it's called The Jail, Managing the Underclass. So it's a beautiful field study of the San Francisco County Jail, conducted in 1980. And I teach it in my course under the heading Urban Marginality. We, you know, we read uh, Drake and Caton, Black Metropolis, and then you know, then then we have a chapter on penality in which we read. We have a week devoted on penality in which we read the jail, and it's always kind of a, a total discovery for the students that you know that of course that you know that people that students of the city haven't studied the jail because when they read the jail, they don't understand how it's not at the center of the study of urban poverty and ethnicity. Yeah. I think there was a colleague at the University of Chicago when I taught at the University of Chicago. He was in poli politics. I don't. I think he, he was head of department in political science. He wrote on the on prison as the historic, like basically the American prison as the uh, the the path, uh, the 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 end of or the the result of the historical path from slavery in America. Yeah. I I, you know, I've, I've written in my the book that I just finished on racial domination as a long chapter. You know, uh, I also wrote an article yes. called "From Slavery to Mass Incarceration." I think Incarceration. that was in 2012. So, so that there's, he, there's he, enormous he literature on incarceration, but it doesn't connect, connect with the literature on urban inequality and marginality. Indeed. And there's a size of, there's a huge literature well, on urban marginality and inequality, but it doesn't connect with literature on penality. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, friends, all participants, urban scholars, whoever, thanks a lot for being here. Thanks a lot in particular to Loic and uh, Bruno, uh, also to uh, Christoph, but he unfortunately his battery died. He was on a laptop. So, so everybody, thank you for everybody for showing up and I hope that you learn as much from the book as I learned from, from reading the book as I learned from writing it. It was a wonderful uh, explanation or introduction in the toolbox, in the conceptual toolbox that the book is presenting. And I think it will kick off a lot of thinking among the participants. Okay. So okay. Uh, let's keep in touch and goodbye. See you next uh, fall, next autumn for the new series of the Heart of the Press. And uh, we will write to everybody about the new uh, season. Thanks a, a lot. A bientôt. Bien Ciao. Bruno, a bientôt. Ciao Bruno. Bye, Bye everybody. Bye, ciao Monica. Thank you. Ciao, ciao. Saluta tutti a Sciences Po, Bruno. Senz'altro. Lo faccio senz'altro, sì. Vai adesso alla festa? Sì, in realtà c'ero già prima questo oggi. Ah. C'è questa grande, grande, sì, grande manifestazione, però, eh, eh, sì, sì, che è stata fra l'altro programmata dopo, eh, eh, ah. però, so, so, 
onestamente sono stato proprio veramente contento di partecipare a questa... No, grazie a te soprattutto, e mi sembra sia stata un'ottima un sessione. Spero a presto, magari vengo in autunno a, a Parigi. Giuri, vieni mm. onestamente, se anche, anche, anche fra l'altro se vuoi, se hai voglia di venire in modo un po' più ufficiale, essendo invitato... Tipo per... eh, Tommaso mi ha mandato un invito, eh, eh beh, sì, perché sono in sabbatico in autunno, quindi Va. adesso verifico con Enzo la, la versione housing e poi... Oh. Guarda, perché ovviamente non so se il nuovo campus di Sciences Po è un bel posto. Eh, mi hanno detto tutti, anche Stein, ah. Osterling, che è stato lì sì, l'anno sì. scorso, insomma. Io sono da, da gennaio a 